Hi guys, my name is Paul Joyce and about a year ago to the day I uh, discovered I was in the high thousands. So uh, I had quite a, a high classification score. And for anybody who might be afraid of a score like that, I just want to tell you how simple the changes are and how uh, exhilarating they actually can be. Apart from the first obvious one is, okay, you have to go on some medication. I take statins, aspirins, blood pressure tablets and vitamins. I feel absolutely no... Uh, different on these things. Maybe a little bit of joint pain in the, from the statins, but nothing, don't notice at all. It takes two minutes in the morning. Uh, having got a bit lazy, I now exercise. I have a personal trainer, and I insist on ma having time for me to do 10,000 steps a day. That's about an hour's walk. It's just a lovely thing to do in the evenings after a hard day. My diet has changed completely. Very simple. It's now low carb, high protein, and like David, I monitor myself if I feel I've kind of given the, the mythics or the sugar has crept in there somewhere. I check that I have a score of six or seven, and I'm fine. Uh, the fourth thing I do, I've reduced my work. I was a 24, 365 workaholic. I now try to work the 35 to 40 hours a week, and that gives me space. space I've learned to meditate, I play golf, I've learned to cook so that I can help at home. I paint pictures, used to always love to be an artist, and I've actually learned to live. The conclusion, the lifestyle changes are so exhilarating, you'd be a fool not to embrace them. It's probably been the best thing in some ways that's happened to me that I got a high classification score, so do not fear that test. Just my point, it just where it all starts, my belief is that the World Health Organization has the same power as the Catholic Church when it comes to nutrition and health. So if we're going to make a change, do you not think it needs to start with those guys? Or is that too financially tied into everything? Is that not the root of the problem? You know, I've done a three-year degree in sports science. And I've learned more today here about science than I did the three years in the college. I, did, I, fa I actually felt that deprived of education. I didn't collect my degree. I've learned more about science in this uh, community and neighbourhood than I have with the degree and the, the, the money that I've spent. And I think we're under the umbrella of the World Health Organisation. And with those guys with the power, like the Catholic Church, we can't make a change. There's too much invested in corruption. I, I, I just for speed, I... <laughs> I'll just say that WHO is a double-edged sword. I mean, they came out in 2002, and not many people know this, and they came out with a six uh, teaspoon max for a woman and nine for a man in 2002. And they were going to publish, and the preliminary report came out. I got hold of it. They said that in 2002. But there was lobbying in America, and they basically rang up and said, you can forget about our finance for the WHO from America if you publish that report. Uh, they published it, actually, in the end, around 10 years later, when the world had moved enough that they were safe to publish it. So that'll give you an idea, and I think as Dr. Joe Craft said to us, and he's a doctor in nuclear medicine, a pathologist, and he's a 60 or 70 year career, but he said, trying to convince doctors of this kind of thing is going to be a long, slow, and arduous battle. And he said, our only hope is to awaken the people because the people now, more and more, are getting access, as you said, Pat, to the science. I got it, and there are routes to get to it. Um, within a few weeks, and I'm not being smart here, within a few weeks of me beginning to research, I had the answer for questions that were kind of a mystery to several dogs, right? And the reason is I went through a root cause methodology through the science, and I followed it from personal expertise, and I found the data. The data is out there. But you need to be able to get it, and I just think that the public, technically minded public, need to be able to access the data. Yeah, just a final thought here from the United States. So um, I think the delivery of health care and misinformation is absolutely universal. It goes, it's worldwide. And I've been a, f a family doctor, a GP, for over 26 years now. And I love coming to work because I, I use food as medicine. It is so much fun. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Jeez, do I have to tell the truth? <laughs> so, 
you know, I blend both nutrition and, and modern medicine. So uh, we haven't totally given up on medication. We use a fair amount uh, of medication uh, for everything, including diabetes and heart disease, especially in those patients who can't comply with the lifestyle uh, change. Well, if you yeah. guys are diabetic, metformin is a pretty good drug, but it's all pain now, so anyway, it's not, not as popular as the pain it was. Thanks. Um, can I just, I have about 5,000 questions, but I'll just go with one or two. Um, thanks so much for everybody for talking about this stuff, because I'm a nutritional therapist and I'm sick to death of just kind of feeling like I'm the only one who is into this whole like low carb, high fat thing, apart from Patricia. Um, Peter Ataya, I'm a big fan of his, I'm sure I pronounced that wrong, and he talks about um, the LDL particle sizing, and he had a question at the very end of one of his YouTube videos, which I'd say Ivor is kind of familiar with, and he talked about the size of the particles when um, the, the nice fluffy LDL particles in relation, and in relation to the quantity of them versus the quantity of small, dense, sticky, bad LDL particles, it could say. He did not know the answer as to whether or not that was potentially damaging for somebody following a high-fat, uh, high low-carb. And I was just wondering, did either of you have any thoughts on the quantity versus quality? Do, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, these are the bolts we showed earlier, and basically there's an associational trend where when you have smaller LDL bolts, and it's measured in an NMR, a nuclear magnetic resonance particle scan or count, uh, when you have smaller or lots of small LDLs, it indicates you're at higher risk. But uh, when you have higher number of those bolts, the LDLP, the particle number of those bolts, that also tracks with higher risk. However, the million dollar question is, those tracking of those small and more with bad outcomes, right, they tracked. That's looking at a lot of people eating really bad diets, right? And if you eat a really bad diet and you become insulin resistant, I'll tell you two things that are going to happen. Your particle number is going to go right up and the size of your particles is going to go down, right, as your VLDL become triglyceride rich. So for people on a bad diet, a high particle number or a small particle distribution tends to track with bad outcomes. But on someone who's on a great diet, right, which generally makes those two measurements better, but what about the small proportion of people who are on a great diet, but it doesn't make those things better and they do have small and they do have a high count, right? Are they okay? I would say my understanding from going through hundreds of papers and data is they're fine. That it's all mediated by insulin resistance. And if you have low inflammation, you've got the right ratios, and you're running a healthy system, that higher particle number don't make any difference. That's for the guys eating the bad stuff who are insulin resistant. That's my opinion. I think, Jeff, you agree, we're both really high particle number. You should okay. be below 1,000 in the particle number. I'm up at 1,800, so is Jeff. What's yeah. it mean to us having researched it? Nothing. Okay. Um, but the definitive answer is not out there. No one knows. And Dr. Thomas Dayspring, uh, who I mentioned earlier, who's one of the foremost lipidologists, I pushed and pushed him on this one and showed him a lot of data to show with low insulin, those no longer track with higher mortality. There's quite a bit of data there. Okay. And his reply to me was, well, Ivor, you're absolutely right. And yeah, by all means, yeah, it could mean nothing if you're not insulin resistant, but you're going to need a billion dollars to prove it because trials I think, are very expensive. Sorry, Jeff. I think if you're, yeah, I think if you're looking at, say, the traditional markers where you're measuring the, the quantity of cholesterol, particle count probably correlates better than uh, LDLC. But aside from that, the, uh, the particle size may be associational, and you have to get a look at the big picture. You can't just look at, say, particle count or particle size. You have to look at all the other markers. Yeah. And just if people ever do get an NMR, an advanced test, and they have a high particle count, remember that the most important measure is the ratio right, of the particle count for the LDLs versus the uh, particle count for the HDLs. So that APOB over APOA1 ratio is crucial. And we will find a huge amount of people, right, in that measure are okay, like I am.
So I have a high particle count, and Dr. Dayspring and most other people would give me medication for that, right? Yeah. They'd be wrong. Because if you look at my particle count over my HDL particle count, right, I've got one of the lowest risks for heart disease in the population from the interheart study. But they don't want to use the ratio any more than they want to use the trig over HDL because that doesn't help the business. The business right. it's a simple LDL is bad message. And that's and, why we've had, had it. For so diagnostically, years. do you think that the calcium test is more, well, it's afford, more affordable and we can get it maybe in this country as opposed to we can't get the lipid size test done in this it's country yet? It's easier to get. It's easier to get. Yeah. Than you, you can easily get it here. I think maybe if you can get those yeah. advanced tests done. You can, but it's not seamless. The yeah. calcium score is, you just go in, you get your score, and you're but out again. The other problem too is these tests could be bad and you might have no disease. Yeah. Yeah. So the calcium score is more definitive. Okay. Actually, uh, just uh, this is the last thing I'll say. I'm sorry. We get this. Last thing I'll say is, I have a high particle count, and my doctor, Dr. Neville Wilson in Minute, has been on a high fat diet for 25 years. He's 75. He looks around 61. He's in great shape. But when I came in and got a test for LP little a, an LDL with a sugar on it, I came in top 1% of the population, and even he got a bit scared. And he said, "Oh God!" So I went and got a CAC and got my zero. But I knew I would because I researched LP little a and that's also an associational tracking variable. But it may mean nothing when you triangulate it with all of the other measures. So it is quite complex, but okay. yeah. Thank you. Final question. Hi, how are you? Um, I'm working in public health as well. Um, I suppose I recently just, uh, I suppose on Monday, I went to a program. It's the Way to Go program in Temp Street for kids with obesity. And like that, um, Monday night, we spent uh, our time looking at the food pyramid and the um, carbohydrates and showing how parents with obese kids how to measure out their portion of carbohydrates per meal. Um, Girl, you're aware of it, obviously, and I'm just kind of conscious of the knowledge amongst the medical field. I mean, obviously, your colleagues and from a government point of view as well. My own, po my own point of view, I was 40 pounds heavier than I am now, yeah. all my life, f eating the food pyramid, uh, exercise hugely, I was cycling uh, 7,000 miles a year for 35 years. I went on, I gave up sugar in 2012, lost 20 pounds give up all sweet things, but I was still eating starch. But then it started to creep back after about 18 months. So I went to LCHF and I'm now down 40 pounds for two and a half years. I have no hunger. I don't care how it works. It works. <laughs> and, and I suppose I mean, with the whole, I suppose there's a massive nutritionist presence here. And we have a, a little representation from a medical point yeah. of view in the community. But th from a dietitian point of view, that's in the acute setting, that's in the primary care team of, of, the, of the health service that we're in. Is there an absolute awareness among here? Like, are we, how many here compared the, to... The problem is, the, the pro I'll tell you the problem you come across now. There's a GP I know in Cork, and I bumped into him recently, and he said to me, and I'd say he hasn't read a medical article for about two years. He says, are you still on that daft diet of yours? He says to me. Now, I've spent, I would have read at least a thousand hours of stuff on all the science, uh, science of this stuff. So I just sent him a, an email saying, you can start your education, recommend you read this book. And he sent me back a thing. He probably will read it. But that is the problem. People are just picking up snippets at meetings and they're not reading and they're not digging. Because when they dig, I mean, when you dig, you say, where is the basis for the food pyramid? It's rubbish. As uh, Gary Taub said, everybody knew that carbohydrates were fattening until suddenly, without any evidence whatsoever, they became slimming. Mm -hmm. But they're not slimming, they're fattening. If you want to fatten animals, you feed them carbohydrates. If you want to fatten pigs, you give them skim milk. Have you gone to kind of government side of things? I have. I've written <laughs> several times. I've written to the professor of public health, whom I know in Trinity, and he discusses his stuff with this. I've written to the uh, Food Safety Authority. I wrote to them again the other day. I said, if I don't get a satisfactory answer, I'm going to the Minister for Health and I'm going to try and do something about it. Maybe some guys here might help me. <laughs> <laughs> We've got to do something about it. I mean, the first thing is fix, yeah. the, the, fix the, the official advice. Would you write to the local staff? Sorry, I interrupted everybody. Yeah. There's a local staff, please, known as for the waiting list of two years. 
years from obesity over 45 year my thing. Yeah. It's only the 45 or 40 anyway or something. I was doing some work experience there. They were from food pyramids. Yeah, but that's why they're so fat. Yeah. <laughs> That's why there's guys. I can just tell you as an engineer, maybe I should go in and just show them, show them my abs. Patricia. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm at the moment getting bashed by the Irish Cancer Society for publishing a book that is extremely well referenced and it talks about exactly what we're talking about tonight. But, but you In see, the Patricia, th they know, you see, they um, know, they're the yeah, anointed. You know what they say, I mean, it's on, on, actually on Twitter, Dr. Robert, or Professor Robert O'Connor, head of research of the Irish Cancer Society, I asked about like, Colin Champ, radiation oncologist from <coughs> Pittsburgh, asked him for data to support his um, statement that ketogenic diets are dangerous, dangerous that um, you know we have to basically follow the food pyramid. And he says he has 25 years of experience. He does not need to link to external references, and that tells me everything. If I get attacked by dietitians, my first question is, have you read the book? The question, is, the answer is no. I don't need to read the book because there are no phase three clinical trials. So that's that's the thinking here, and that's it's the ketogenic kitchen, and yeah, that's, that's the big problem. Again, I'm ex exactly in the same position as David. I'm a cancer patient. I had cancer twice. I am really passionate to get this get the word out there, and to potentially help people and um, present the latest evidence. And it's just being blatantly ignored because there are no phase three clinical trials that we will never have in nutrition. And that's exactly what happened. Yeah, but that, you saw that today. They were looking for randomised exactly. trials, which is never going to happen yeah. because you're never going to get a ten-year study. Pat went with me to visit the Minister of Health. Can you just say in two lines what he said? Yeah. Can I just say the Barrow Institute? is um, setting up clinical trials looking at ketogenic diets as an adjuvant for cancer. Yeah, yeah, and Adrian, Adrian Schnepp. Adrian, she, she writes in our book, she's not our expert. I know, no. this is... I said, they don't want to come up with the radio They don't want to. It's just a complete block. No, it's just not going to be We don't want to know about it. Yeah, absolutely. David and I met the minister about a year ago um, to suggest that um, we might consider the thousand or so research papers that supported the evidence that calcification was a better predictor of um, all cause mortality, actually. Um, and you know, the minister, the former minister, was, was, a, was a doctor, um, but he was a doctor, and I think we got him on him particularly thorny evening, but um, the, the, the answer was, the, 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 the interpretation that we took out of it um, was that I'm a doctor, you guys aren't, um, I don't care, I know more, what are you trying to tell me? Um, and, and essentially it was, you know, I, I, I studied this, one, one of my insights um, from the three years with David or whatever on this, um, is, is this, um, and it, it goes very, it's very simple, that education, um, success, um, and uh, one, or one or other of self-interest, um, or, or um, economics, is a really dangerous combination, really dangerous, particularly in medicine. And I think you have the confluence of both of those, um, I, I regret to say, in cardiology, because you've got well-educated people um, in education in the sense of well trained in a particular discipline. They're very successful um, and highly self-interested um, and very profitable and that is a really, really dangerous combination. And when I read the disclosures um, on all of the papers that I read, what I'm really interested to see is that they disclose donations from scientific foundations. But the principal source of all the revenue of the, their principal source of income is interventional cardiology. There is no, there is no disclosure on that. Is that not a self-interest? I rest.
Hi, and just to say that thank you, I found this evening really informative. Um, I'm just a mum of two um, kids. Um, I've always had an interest in feeding them well and thinking that you know food is medicine, etc. Um, and my husband uh, said to me a while ago about the introduction of his some of Ivor's um, data and bringing in higher fats, and I could see with him success within a couple of weeks. Um, we've introduced things like that into our diet at home and seen changes definitely very, very easy to implement. But my um, point for you this evening is about communication. Um, even though my husband was speaking to me for the last year or so about this, it hasn't really clicked with me. I could introduce the changes because I couldn't see any reason not to. It made sense to me. It's all natural foods. But coming here this evening, the way it's been communicated has been very informative for me. Um, uh, he loves the whole data analysis, the figures, show me the data, like the GP, a lot of nutritionists here, whereas from my point of view I love the David story. David's story is hitting home with me and I will go and get that test done for my husband because it will be my family and myself because of our kids. So I think really my point is just to target the communication depending on who the audience is and there's an awful lot of people who do question you know, medicine, and we do go with what our heart and what our common cells tells us is the right thing to do. So, depending on who your audience is, you know, data and data analysis can be so important, but also human interest stories, David, like your experience, can actually target people like me who are not, you know, a science background or whatever, but we have an interest in our own, take responsibility for our own health. So, it's been a really informative. Thank you. Excellent comment. I think we're pretty tight in time, we're 30 minutes over, so we'll do another one and maybe we'll talk all around the prevention, because you know all about the CAC now, right? Sorry, wait, 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 for just one thing, oh. if you have a doctor who doesn't believe in the CAC, please don't send your doctor to me, you, you, as you say, you treat them, you get your results back, it's bad, he doesn't believe it, how do you, you know, where are you Change doctors. Yeah, never will seem a new to a good person to go to because he understands all this in depth, including the carbon and fat metabolism, and he's published on cholesterol peer reviewed. So go to these two GPs after their. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> these are on the journey. Yeah, yeah. 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 send a lot of links out to various resources. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs>